Okay, we now come to scripture reading. And let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, verses uh, 8 to 21. Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 21. And I'll be reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 21. Verse 8. Then they heard the sound of Yahweh God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh God in the midst of the trees of the garden. Yahweh God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave to me from the tree, and I ate. Then Yahweh God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And Yahweh God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you more than any of the cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat, all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain and conception. In pain you will bear children, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. The curse is the ground because of you. In pain you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread until you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now the man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. Then Yahweh God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Now yesterday we spent a couple of sessions learning about the creation of the world, how we all came to this world, and also um, what made the world fall from God. It's, the call, it's what we call the fall, theologically, and that Adam and Eve actually were cast out and vanished out of the Garden of Eden. Now, all of those stories may sound like some sort of legend or myths from long, long time ago, but they are written in the words of God in the Bible. And we saw that they were actually true. Some of the things like the location of the Garden of Eden was real. And we can actually see um, that we all come from one set of parents, Adam and Eve. And we all are born with sinful nature. And because of that, we do the things that we often do not wish to do and commit sins before God. What's important in all of this is, all of these at first may sound somewhat foreign and somewhat counterintuitive to our thinking. But we um, realize that we are dealing with God's truth that has been given to us. We're dealing with God's law and His standard. We're dealing with God's kingdom and we're dealing with God's court. If you stand in a court, then you respect the law of that court and you simply have to follow that rule. And we are dealing with God's court and God's rule. And we have to see what the Bible says and not necessarily what I think. Of course, there would be inconsistencies and some gaps between the two, but that's the whole learning process. We learn and we see the truth more and more and then we um, come to know what really is the truth. Jesus once said in John chapter 17, your word is truth, God's word is truth. And by this truth we are sanctified or made clean or purified. And that's our prayer, that our knowledge and understanding that are not true and often infected by all the lies of the world would be purified and cleansed by God's Word. And that's what Jesus prayed. And that can be done as we go back to the Word of God, to the truth, to the Bible, and to learn this and to understand what God 
has to say. What we realized when we saw yesterday was a whole lot of sins, sinful nature, all the you know, unpleasant things. Uh, you wouldn't go up to a man in the street and say, uh, excuse me, sir, you're a sinner. Um, that would be a very rude thing to say. But um, you know, when we go back to the Bible and come to churches like this, that's what we are confronted with, it, essentially. We look at the Bible, and the Bible condemns us, and basically um, um, he judges us and says that we are born with sin. We saw that in Psalm 51, as David said, I was brought forth in sin, and my mother conceived me in iniquity. And because we are born in sin, we do the things that are sinful before God. And we have this tendency uh, to do the things that are not right. And if you've raised children, then you know how that is. You don't have to teach your children to behave in a bad way, because they do automatically. You, in fact, have to teach them to behave in a good way um, so that you know, they grow up uh, in a better way. So all of the education, most of the education, especially in young age, is to do with correction and saying no more than saying yes. Why? It's because we have that ingrained human sinful nature in us. But often because we are all surrounded with each other by you know, one another, we compare ourselves to other people. And we realize that man, man or woman, human beings, has, um, man has this high view of himself more than what it is actually in truth. We think that we are more righteous than we actually are. And in fact, we think that God is less righteous than actually He is. And that's the fallen thought. But the Bible corrects us and brings us back to the truth and tells us that we are all sinful before God. And that is regardless of what good deeds you might have done. It says in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, it says, All our righteousness, righteousnesses are like filthy rags. And we appear before God as filthy rags. So we realize that our destiny is the judgment, the righteous judgment of God. And the righteous judgment of God is to compare ourselves according to the standard of God that is perfect. The Bible says that no one can reach that standard. No one can say that I am good enough to go to heaven. No one can say that I am righteous before God. It says clearly that all have sinned and we fall short of the perfect glory and the perfect standard of God. It clearly says in Romans chapter 3 verse 23. What we usually do when it comes to religion or even morality is that people try to do good things. They try to build up their life based on their works. They might have uh, some achievements, they might do some good deeds, and they think that they can stand on them. Let me show you a picture that um, gives you a little sort of description of what, what we do. It's a very simple way. Say that you've got a man, that person's born with sin just like all of us, and you've got this sort of you know, lake of fire representing hell, and you're reaching, you're trying to reach God's heaven, the kingdom of God. But man's righteousness is, is to build up your life on the things that you do. Like, you know, you might give offerings to church, and you go to church and pray. You might have some position in the church, or maybe in the society. You have a lot of zeal and effort and hard work. You build up some good deeds, and you might go to church on Sundays. You might experience miracles and say that even you perform miracles, and some people hear that in, in, in the Bible. And on top of that, you keep the law and see, I've kept all these laws. Like uh, a couple of occasions, a young man came to Jesus and said, look, I've kept all the laws. What more do I need to go to heaven? Do I, you know, am I not good enough? Have I done enough to go to heaven? But the Bible tells us clearly that none of these things can get you to heaven. It's almost like trying to build a staircase to heaven. But we realize that all these will fall because the Bible says, it is not what you do, but it is what, um, it is not the works that you have done, but it is what you are and who you are that is in question more. You know, with sin, there's no way we can go to heaven, and we can only rely on God. But what we realize, therefore, is that there's nothing you can do to save yourself. There's nothing you can do to go to heaven on your own. 
that also drives us back to back to God and to the Word of God. And, and we, we ask God, then what? What can I do? Help me, please. And that's the surrender and submission and repentance from our sin. Let me show you this slide. And this is essentially a summary of what we studied yesterday. So we are born into this world, but we are born as a sinner. We are all born as sinners. In Psalm 51 verse 5, it says clearly, I was brought forth in sin or iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. And because of that, we go on sinning. And that actually explains a lot of things that we do. It's not that we sin and become sinners, but we are born as sinners, and therefore we sin. In Jeremiah 17, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, and who can know it. God sees our heart. We can observe our external behaviors. In fact, the world's court usually makes judgment based on what you've done. God's court, however, judges us not only based on what we've done, but also what we think, what's in our heart. And the Bible says that heart is deceitful above all things, and it is desperately wicked, and it is beyond cure. And so much so, Job said, we are like worms, we are like maggots, we saw that yesterday. And he says, if you're born as a human being from a woman, then you know, we are so sinful and guilty before God. And he says, how much does man who is abominable and filthy, and that's, by the way, in God's eyes, who drinks iniquity like water. The Bible also tells us that we all die. In fact, the reason why, why we die is because we have sin. There was a tribe called Taliyabo tribe in Indonesia, and um, some decades ago, missionaries went in, and they tried to teach the Bible and tried to preach the gospel, and the whole village came to Christ. But what, what they discovered was really intriguing, because they had this myth and legend um, that they used to have someone on the islands who had eternal life. But since that person left, they lost eternal life and they became mortal beings. And since then, death came and they saw their people dying. And often dying because of disease or old age or sickness or accidents. And they were wondering why. They're not asking a medical question. You know, they're, they're not asking why people died because of some pneumonia or you know, bite from um, you know, mosquitoes and malaria and so on. They were asking more philosophical question why human beings actually die. They didn't have an answer for that. All they had was the legend from a long time ago that once upon a time, a long, long time ago, they lived forever with eternal life. They were drinking from the river of life, and they were living forever, but since they left, they lost eternal life, and therefore they became mortal beings, and everybody was dying. And they were trying all sorts of things to prevent death. They had a witchcraft, uh, like fortune sort of teller called um, Shaman, and he would do certain rituals, you know, dancing and um, sacrifices, and, and he would sometimes even prescribe some, some medicine, some herbs, and say that, you know, you can try this, you can try that, and perhaps they can prevent death. But they couldn't. One by one they died, and then they uh, even tried to uh, keep the dead body. Um, in fact, um, you know, their tradition was that if someone dies, then they would actually watch over that dead body as long as it was necessary. And usually, after some months, the, the dead body would become bones, and they would even have a little box that would you know, store all these bones and sometimes in, in their own room, hoping that the person might come back to life. And they were always you know, thinking and grappling and, and struggling against death, and they tried to prevent death as much as possible. They, they couldn't, and we know that, because we all die. Why? Again, not a medical reason, but why do we die? The Bible tells us a very similar story. Adam and Eve, when they were created, they were created innocent beings, and they were living in the garden, in the paradise, as eternal beings. And they had this tree of life in the midst of the garden. And God said, do not eat from just this one tree, not the tree of life, but this one tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But all the other trees you can freely eat. So, 
if you read it carefully, they actually were able to eat from the tree of life. Meaning that they were eating the tree of life and fruit of eternal life and they were living eternally and forever. Well, they were able to live forever, but they lost it. So these people are uh, intolerable. Um, they were hopeless. Um, they were losing hope one by one. Their people were dying. And you know, they, they tried even sending a raft with all kinds of fruit um, as sacrifice. And even the dead bones, the bodies of uh, the dead bones, the bones of the dead people, and then they would actually send it away into the ocean, thinking that the very first man who lived uh, with the eternal life who has left since then would perhaps see that and return with somehow um, the message of eternal life. And then the missionaries came. Um, so when the missionaries came, they were really received really um, um, with, with um, eager welcome. Um, and they spent about four years learning the language because you know, this was a remote tribe and they did not know the language. It was all oral culture. So they learned the language for four years. And then for six months after that, they started teaching the Bible all the way you know, from Genesis to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Six months. Just imagine that. And during that time, they spent almost four hours every day for six months to learn the scripture from these missionaries. And um, the rumor spread to the neighboring, neighboring villages. And, and they all moved and, and came and built more houses to house all these people. And up to about 400 people, I heard, um, were coming daily to learn the scripture, learn the Bible, eventually coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and that they finally now have eternal life. Physically, they may die, but they have eternal life spiritually. And they knew that they would be raised from the dead just like Jesus was raised from the dead. And that's the resurrection. That's what we celebrate during the Easter, which is coming just in a few weeks' time. And basically, they accepted Christ, and they understood the truth. And the whole village was celebrating that occasion. Now, there's a little documentary on that um, from about 20 or 30 years ago. So um, if you do a little search, you can even find that and watch that. So the reason essentially we die, you know, they didn't know that, but the reason why we die, they learned that from the Bible, is because of sin. Because of sin. Now we, we uh, talk about you know, dying from disease and sickness and so on, and that's how we die. Why we die is because of sin. In other words, if you know that you're going to die sometime, then you know that you have sin. Because if you didn't have sin, then you wouldn't have to die. But because you die, it just demonstrates that you have sin, and that's what the Bible tells us. It's because we are born as sinners, we sin. It's almost like um, you inherit things from your parents. You, know, you might inherit your family name, you might inherit your appearance, your character, your personality. And something that comes along with that is sin or sinful nature. Our propensity to do the things that are offensive to the perfectly righteous God. And, and that's what we've studied yesterday. So eventually death comes. The Bible tells us also that after death comes the judgment. In Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed for men to die once, but after this is the judgment. And the wages of sin is death. The trouble is, it is not only physical death, but it is eternal spiritual death. So as much as we would like to avoid, the inevitable outcome of this is the lake of fire. The Bible tells us in many places, including this one in Revelation 20, and anyone whose name is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Well, this is what the Bible tells us. If you don't accept this, then actually you don't need Jesus, do you? If you think that you're okay and this is not true for you, then you don't need salvation. Well, it is true for everybody. In fact, um, let me just say that the truth is unique. There's only one truth. You can't have multiple truths. This is the truth. The Bible tells us that. The truth is also unchanging. You cannot modify or change truth. If it is true, then it is true always. And also, truth is universal, which means truth applies to all people. And you can't sort of, you know, put a blanket and say that, it doesn't apply to me, even though it applies to all the other people. It's not me. I'm accepted from that. That, that doesn't happen. If it is true, then it is true for 
all people. You might deny it, you might reject it, you might even you know, not believe it, but what is true is still true. So our responsibility is to learn what the truth is. And the truth for now is that we are all sinful before God. It's almost like um, knowing that you have a disease. Jesus once said that I came to call sinners to repentance and to eternal life. I did not come for righteous people. If you think you're righteous, Jesus is saying, if you think you're righteous, you don't need me. You're okay with, you know, with your own righteousness, but of course that's not true. But Jesus said, I came for sinners who need Savior. I need sinners. I, need, I came for people who need salvation, deliverance from sin. So as a spiritual physician, Jesus comes and tells us from and through the Bible that we have this disease called sin. And the only one who can give us the cure is God himself. Nothing that we do, nothing that we can come up with can cure us from that disease of sin. And we know that. Just look at the world history. Look at the world history for thousands of years that, that we know of. The world history is all plagued with wars and you know, battles and, and crimes and all kinds of terrible things. Well, you, know, you might say that, yes, on the other hand, there are some goodness of human beings. Of course, you know, we've done some amazing things and good things, and there are people who sacrifice their lives for the good of the human humanity and for the world. Well, a couple of things. Um, one, that's because we were created in God's image. We have the remnant or we have the, um, the resemblance of God. We have the image of God. We have a little bit of God's nature. So we are sometimes you know, compassionate, merciful, gracious, courageous. We pursue truth. And all of these good things come from God. And in fact, you know, they are there so that we would come back to God and find Him. And secondly, yes, they're good, but as we were reminded from Isaiah chapter 64, all these righteous deeds are not good enough to send you to heaven. It's because in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20, he says, there is not one righteous man who does good and does not sin. The problem is sin. I mean, you can have all the goodness, but if you still have sin, that's not perfect, is it? And if you have a glass of water, but mix it with a drop of poison, You've got 99% of water, but only 1% poison, but it's still a poison. You wouldn't drink it. What you want is perfect and pure righteousness without any sin. I mean, if you want heaven, wouldn't you want that in heaven? And why would you want a heaven that is almost good, but not perfect? And that's why unless you attain that perfectness before God without any sin whatsoever, you cannot go to heaven. If you imagine a spectrum or a graph, you know, um, you know those bar graphs that goes from this end and to that end, and you've got the full spectrum. Let's say that this end is heaven, and, and this is, is hell. So um, just imagine a bar graph. This chunk is heaven, and this chunk is hell. And in between is a very small space. This space is like this world. We are kind of caught in between heaven and hell. And if you are saved, then you go to heaven. Of course, you know, you can still, as someone who goes to heaven, you can still do so much for God and so much for God's righteousness and, and stand before God with, you know, some rewards, maybe you're going towards the spectrum. But on the other hand, you've got this hell. Um, the Bible does tell us that there is a different degree of punishment in hell. It's not all the same for all people. You know, you go to hell, but there are people who are punished more and you know, more pain than some other people, but still you're nonetheless in hell. It's almost like you know, you're in the prison and there are some uh, maximum security you know, cells and, and I guess you know, cells and, and prisons with some, some freedom. But nonetheless, you're still in prison, you're still in hell, and we were kind of caught in between. What, what the Bible teaches us is this. You can do good works in this world, but good works do not make you go to heaven. It doesn't give you entry to heaven. Good works that you do after you enter heaven counts. It, it gives you more reward and God's glory. Just as it is with hell, the, the more you do evil and terrible, you know, bad, sinful things, the more punishment you have in hell. But now, for now, we are in between. We see a little bit of heaven, we see a little bit of hell in this world. But 
once you are in heaven, that is not because of anything that you've done, but it is only by God's grace. God has to let you in by His grace. Of course, He doesn't do that uh, for nothing. You know, He doesn't do it randomly or arbitrarily. It is all written in the Bible, you know, how you enter into heaven. But of course, you know, if you're not in heaven, whatever you do in this world is only a little taste of what is good in heaven. And of course, you might taste a little bit of hell by tasting what is evil in this world. And that's, that's what the truth is. The Bible tells us that we faced all this judgment of God, eternal lake of fire. Now having said that, let's now go back to Genesis and see from Genesis chapter 3 what's happening and what God is doing um, actually about this, this sin that Adam and Eve have done. You know that Adam and Eve, they were in the garden in the paradise. And now, they listened to the lie of the devil, serpent, and they ended up eating that fruit. Of course, the sin is not so much eating that fruit. It's not that the fruit had poison or anything bad in it that made them dead or that made them dying, because they eventually died. It is because God told them not to eat and they ate. It is the disobedience that became the beginning of sin. What caused them to do that was the lie of the serpent. The serpent deceived and said, did God really say that you cannot eat from any of the trees? God said, you can eat from any tree, all trees, but this one. But Satan um, confused them and said, did God say that you cannot eat from any of the trees? And Eve said, no, 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 we can eat from all the trees, but not this one. In fact, um, um, you can't even touch it. Um, God never said that, but the woman was confused, and then the woman said, well, we, we can't even touch it. And then Satan came with even greater lie and said, no, you will not die. You shall surely not die. That's completely the opposite to what God said. In fact, Satan sows even doubt in her heart. The reason why God told you not to eat is because you might become like God. A little bit of jealousy there as well. And she doubted God for a minute. And then she saw the fruit. It looked good to be good fruit. Pleasant to the eyes in verse 6. And it was desirable to make one wise. And this is basically classic three ways that people can be tempted and to sin. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Boasting uh, and desiring and coveting whatever that looks good to your eyes, you go and want to get it. And therefore people listen to their lust. Well, that was the first sin and she ate and she gave it to husband and, she, and Adam also ate the fruit. It's really interesting because they were the first man and the woman, husband and wife. You can see that, it, that in this um, relationship you see the origin of marriage conflict. You know, from the moment that they actually ate this fruit, they saw first of all that they were naked and they, they um, had shame. Guilt and shame sank into their hearts. And they are in uh, this blaming game. Straight away, God said, why did you eat? Adam said, well, you know, the woman gave it to me. And God said, why did you eat, woman? And the woman said, well, the serpent deceived me. Uh, and then God curses and pronounces the punishment to the serpent and the woman and the man in order in Genesis chapter 3. So there is the doubt, jealousy, blaming, um, and um, trying to defend yourself um, all of that is actually in Genesis chapter 3 that became the beginning of sin. But have a look at chapter 3 verse 15. Let me read from verse 14. Uh, I'll show you the verse 15 on the screen very soon. But in verse 14 it says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, to the snake, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. This was the curse to the serpent, the snake. So they um, crawl on their bellies. Some people say that, well, it's possible the serpents had legs before this, because if it didn't, then this wouldn't be any different from before. Maybe, you know, we don't know, but that's uh, an interesting speculation. But to crawl on the belly, on the ground, is a curse. Um, and 
it, it says that you shall eat dust all the days of your life. But if you look at the snake, what, what do they eat? They, they don't eat dust, do they? So what does it mean to eat dust or to lick dust? In the ancient um, literature, licking dust or even eating dust was a sign of surrender and defeat. If you have your enemy, um, often in the Asian culture, you know, might stamp upon the head of the enemy, you know, if your enemy is alive, and make the enemy eat dirt. Sign of defeat. So what God is saying to the serpent is that, that you are defeated. And that's the curse. Now notice here. God is pronouncing judgment on Satan, serpent. Uh, this is quite interesting uh, and important because people sometimes think that God and Satan are in competition on kind of equal level. And that's not so. The Bible makes it so clear that God is always the Lord and He is always the judge and He is always above everything and everyone else. Even Satan is under the control of, of, of God and Satan is to get permission from God to do certain things. So he only operates under the, um, the rule of God. And here, God clearly pronounces Satan to this punishment, that you are defeated. How will that happen? How will Satan be defeated totally and completely? Now, in verse 15, he continues on and explains this. Let me show you that verse on the screen. He says, and I will put enmity between you, serpent, and the woman whom you have deceived, and between your seed and her seed, that's um, her offspring. Um, in fact, we'll see that it's in capital S. This refers to the one who is to come. In fact, let me tell you that's Jesus Christ. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. You'll try to bruise him and to destroy him, but it'll be only to bruise his heel. But he will destroy your head. He'll crush your head. And this is how you will be defeated. This is what God is saying. You will eat dirt all your life. Because I will put enmity between you and the woman. Now, what, what is this saying? Is this merely saying that you know, women will hate snakes? We, we don't usually don't like snakes. Um, and you get scared of snakes. Of course, this is not that kind of animosity. Look at the word enmity here. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Enmity is um, basically a deep animosity between two morally responsible beings. Enmity is never used in terms or in relation to the animals. He's not saying something, you know, there will be some, some animosity or some enmity between the snake, the animal, and the woman, human beings. But he's saying that between you, Satan, and between the woman, there will be enmity, animosity. So there will be always, um, um, they will be all at odds with one another. And because of that, he, the seed of the woman, will destroy your head, bruise your head. You might try to destroy him, but you only end up bruising his heel. Basically, this is what happened. Satan deceived woman and the man. And for a moment, he might have thought that he had certain victory. Now, God created man in his own image, and he wanted to display his glory through Adam and Eve. But that wasn't going to happen without any tests, so God gave them a test to pass, not to eat the fruit, but they failed. When they failed, and because they listened to the, the lie of the, of the devil, Satan, devil and Satan, the same thing. The devil um, is, is what describes who he is, and Satan is his name. When Satan deceived Eve and Adam, and when they did not listen to God for a moment, he thought he had certain victory over man, and therefore over God, even. Because he had turned basically the humanity, Adam and Eve, away from God and to be deceived into his lies. It's almost like um, capturing Adam and Eve and to bring them under his control. In fact, um, you know, that, that's what it is when people are born in sinful nature and without God, they are under the manipulation of the devil 
That's how they live their lives, doing the things that are sinful and end up in eternal hell without, if you die without Christ. So Satan thought, yes, victory. But that was only bruising his heel. In fact, um, even later, when Satan crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, you might have thought that he had another victory there because he killed the Son of God. But that was only hurting his heel. He rose from the dead, and he pronounced greater victory on Satan and death and sin. So when God said this, he was essentially saying, now you think you have victory? No. You will be defeated and eat dirt all your life. In fact, I will put animosity and enmity between you and the woman, and the woman's seed to come, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He will come and he will destroy your head. You will be completely de destroyed. You might try to destroy him, but it will be only to bruise his heel. So God is actually pronouncing victory here. Satan was defeated, or defeat was pronounced or announced. God would essentially turn the humanity away from Satan and to turn them to be against Satan and for God. And that redeemed humanity would be his people, the church, Christians. It's also uh, interesting, he says, firstly, if you look at old um, ancient literature, um, it, it's always very um, sort of male-centered. And you would read things like his seed. Where you have father and mother, and usually it's the father's seed that brings life and more children. But he says, her seed. And this is the only place where you have this expression, her seed, or the woman's seed will come. And that's because of the birth of Jesus Christ. I mean, you, you know the, the story of Christmas. Christmas story is when Jesus was born. He was born from the Virgin Mary. That Joseph was Virgin Mary or Mary's husband or husband to be. But when Jesus was born, they they were not really, um, you know, married, um, and they were engaged. And Jesus was born from the conception of the Holy Spirit by God's miraculous power. So she, the woman, bore a child, and the Bible says, "You shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us." He shall save his people from their sins, and the virgin shall conceive and bear a child, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's why this is mercy. And because this is the only place where you see this, this expression, this has to refer to a particular specific person, one man, not anyone else. And that's why it is in capital, because this is a perfect pronoun. This is the name. This is referring to an actual person to come, and that refers to Jesus Christ, that he would come and he would restore things by having victory. So think, think about this. Genesis chapter 3 from verse 14 is the curse on the serpent and the woman and the man. But in the midst of this curse is a hope, hope of restoration, hope of reconciliation with God, hope of forgiveness of their sin. And it's very significant that this comes right at the beginning of the curse, before the curse on the woman and before the curse on the man in the ground. Can you see how eager God is in announcing the solution to the problem of sin? They just made a big mess. Adam and Eve didn't listen to God, and they're now you know, dying because God said, if, if you eat this, you will die. And, and they just lost eternal life, and they are terribly ashamed, and they're, they're trying to cover their guilt by sowing some thick leaves, which wasn't really proper clothing anyway. And they're now scared, afraid, and, and they're worried. And then God comes and pronounces judgment, and in the midst of judgment, even before he comes to the woman and the man, God is very hasty in announcing, look, there will be this defeat of the devil, and I'll use this woman and woman's seed to bring the destruction upon you. And this shows God's heart and his desire to save the fallen man. And as early as Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. And that's why this verse, chapter 3 verse 15 is called the first gospel. The first gospel. Until the New Testament gospel was written, the Matthew, the Mark, Luke, John, 
this was really the only gospel, very specific and explicit gospel that they had throughout the Old Testament times. This is all you know, before the law, you know, Adam, uh, law and Abraham and Moses and all the stories that we see in the, in the Old Testament, way, way back at the beginning. And because of that, we see this verse in, in Romans 16, in the New Testament. God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. You see, this is not only God defeating Satan, but he will actually cause Satan to be crushed under your feet, and that's our feet, the feet of his people, his redeemed humanity, the church. And this will happen. And God gave them the promise. But of course um, giving them the verbal promise was somewhat not enough. So what God does in addition to this comes in verse 21. Now in verse 21 for all, he says also for Adam and his wife. So not only telling them this but also for Adam and Eve God made tunics of skin. I'm sure this verse on the screen as well. God made tunics of skin, or garments of skin, or leather garments, and clothed them. But first of all, that covered their shame. You know, the fig leaf, they don't, they, they don't need that anymore. So they are now wearing leather clothes, which is you know, far more durable and proper than something that was made from fig leaves. But at the same time, tunics of skin, or the leather, is only obtained by slaughtering animals. And, and that's obvious. But where do you get leather? Leather comes from animals, and there has to be killing, tearing off the skin, and you know, just skinning that animal and bringing that and making it into a kind of tunic, you know, one sort of one piece, um, you know, clothing that you, you put on yourself. And that means they saw death before their eyes. They saw death for the first time. Because not a lot of um, time has passed since the creation of, of man, but still, it was the world without death. It was the world with eternal life. But once they lost that, they saw death. Now, but remember in chapter 2, God said, In the day you eat this fruit, you shall surely die. And he said, In the day or on that day that you eat, you will die. But Adam and Eve did not die on that day, did they? Well, they were dying, so they lost eternal life. So in a sense, the, the eternal life and the power of the eternal life that they had before was such that they enjoyed life for a long, long time. In fact, Adam lived 930 years, almost a thousand years. And you might think, you know, was that possible? The Bible says that they lived that long. It wasn't just him, but a whole lot of people at that time lived close to 1,000 years. And even medical experts agree that that's possible if you have ideal condition where cells don't age as rapidly as they do nowadays. The world was very different. The world was very protected, um, and it was protected from all the harmful things from the space. So it was a very different world, and even the fossils of the great dinosaurs and trees tell us that they were growing big and strong and living a lot longer. And it's, it's possible for them to live a long time. But still, they were mortal, and they still died. But God said, on that day you'll die. But they didn't die. Why is that? Why isn't it happening according to what God had said? Well, there's a concept, if you look at the Bible, but throughout the Bible there's the concept of what we call um, substitution, substitutionary death. Often, because God is God of grace, He is also merciful, that He does not judge sinners immediately according to their sin. If he did, then none of us would be here. Think about that. God is so perfect and so righteous that he cannot tolerate even one sin. If God judges sinners immediately, the moment he discovers one sin in our life, and that's from birth, by the way, no one would be here. We'd be all judged, and we would all deserve eternal punishment straight away. But because God is merciful, patient, long-suffering, He's also gracious, He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that immediately. He actually suffers long. He delays His sentence, and He provides opportunity for people to be saved. 
So we see this substitution all throughout the Bible. You know, people bringing in substitution for their death. And often it was the innocent animal. So what hap what's happening here in chapter 3 is, yes, Adam and Eve should have died. But they didn't, God didn't kill them. But instead they witnessed the death of the animal before their eyes. We don't know how many animals died, but you know, some animals died and, and leather was obtained from them. And they saw the death of the animal, or death of anything for the first time. And they realized that this is death that they should have suffered. Just imagine how scared that they, may, they must have been. I mean, they saw the, the uh, animal dying before their eyes, bleeding, and in suffering, and in pain. And then God skinning them and giving them the skin and as tunics. And because leather garments are quite durable, we can imagine that they were wearing this for a long, long time to come. And you know, we see in subsequent chapters that they were also um, sacrificing animals and they were obtaining leather. In fact, I mean, it might interest you, but during this time, they only ate vegetables. They were all herbivorous. All the, the human beings and all the animals, even lions, uh, we see from the implication from the Bible, even the lions and all these meat-eating animals back then were eating vegetables. So there was no need to kill animals, not for food, at least. The two reasons why they killed animals was because they sacrificed animal to God because they realize that only through death they can come to God. And of course, they can't kill themselves if they killed animals. And God allowed that, and that substitution. And secondly, they killed animals to obtain leather for garments, for clothes, not for food. Food comes later after the flood. But this becomes now a sign of forgiveness and restoration and reconciliation. Because God says, look, this animal died in place of you, instead of you. And the tunics of skin is a sign for that substitutionary death. Let me show you just a little picture about this. So God gave them a sign of forgiveness, and this is how. Animal was killed instead of Adam and Eve, and blood is shed as a sign. The sin that they had was essentially transferred over to the animal, and the animal died, bearing that sin, and the leather garment was given as a sign of that. So this leather garment, or tunics of skin, becomes now the sign of forgiveness. Even though they're cast out of the Garden of Eden, they have this promise that her seed will destroy Satan and bring defeat on the devil. And they had this sign of forgiveness, the tunics of skin that they were wearing. And just before this, they had witnessed the death the substitute death for them. Now this would become basically a pattern in the Old Testament. So when you see all these animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, it's because of their sin. It's because God allowed substitutionary death and they were killing these animals as sacrifice to come before God and to receive some kind of favor and to be accepted by God because without death, that wouldn't happen. And that's why as soon as chapter 4 you see um, that Abel offered God from the first limb of the flock. He actually offered the first one of his flock, the animal, and, and that was accepted by God. But Cain offered to God all kinds of produce from the ground, and that produce was not accepted by God. Not because of effort or beauty or anything like that. It's not in there, but it's the death and blood that was in question. Now, let's fast forward the clock a little bit here, because this was a very important reminder for them. So what God wanted to do was for, for the people to remember this and to look forward to her seed that was to come to destroy the work of the devil completely. So what they did was, and what, what God did was, what God told his people, there was a nation called Israel that God chose, and um, God told them, do this every year to remember and to pass it down your generations uh, of, of posteri posterity that um, you have to kill these animals because without death you cannot come to me. By the way, these animals are only signs and the real death has to be the death of the seed of the woman, the one that I would send, the one that I had promised. And when he comes, he will destroy the work of the devil. 
So if you go to the Old Testament, especially the book of Exodus, there's this whole lot of people of Israel, Israel the people of God, um, and Moses is now leading them. And God says to Moses, do this every year. Bring a lamb, a couple of lambs, and kill them. And bring the sacrifice before me, and I will forgive you, and this will last for a year. So basically, God gave them ceremonial laws to do this every year. And they were to do this every year. And just as it was starting, what, what happened was um, that the Israelites were actually um, in Egypt. Um, I'll, I'll give you a very quick summary of what happened in the ancient history of Israel. God chose Abraham and made him the father of the nation Israel. They go down to Egypt and they migrate and lived in Egypt for a long, long time, nearly 430 years because of famine in that land. They came down, first of all, to buy food, but they ended up selling that. But soon they became slaves because the nation Egypt saw these uh, people of Israel uh, multiplying, uh, becoming very wealthy. Uh, they take possession of the good land in their country, and they're different people. And Egyptians felt threatened by them, and they thought, well, if the enemy attacks us, they might join hands with the enemy and then attack us. So uh, let's make them slaves. So Israelites, Jewish people, became slaves all of a sudden in the land of Egypt. And by the way, that's when they were used to build all these uh, huge structures like pyramids and sphinx um, and all these storehouses for crops in Egypt. But because the work was so heavy and the labor was so bad that they were crying out to God. But God, didn't you promise that, that you would choose us as your people? But we are, look, no, we are only slaves. And we are laboring all day long, and this is just too bad, and this is too much suffering. Please deliver us. So God hears a prayer and sends Moses, and Moses delivers them out of the land of Egypt. But of course, the Egyptians wouldn't let them go, because you know, if you lose all the labor force, um, there were at least 600,000 men over the age of 20. So imagine losing that workforce from your country. And by the way, you know, when they left, they left with all kinds of know, treasure and money and gold and livestock. So the whole country would be you know, collapsing. For 400 years, they enjoyed having these slaves, and the Egyptians didn't have to do the work in you know, hard labor, farming and you know, tending the flocks and so on. It was considered very lowly. They were doing all this dirty work. And now they're going away, because they wouldn't do that. So king, king of Egypt, Pharaoh, would say, you cannot go. God said to Moses, let them go through Moses. And King said, uh, no, he cannot. And God said, well, I'll, I'll bring some plagues on you. So God actually said, you know, God warned and, and said, then I will bring 10 plagues on this land. You know, one after the other, 10 plagues came, um, all sort of natural disasters and some disaster from all the uh, you know, insects like locusts, um, all kinds of um, disease and, and livestock. Was, was dying and the people were dying and um, whenever they they were struck with this plague the king pharaoh would say well you can go but you have to come back you can only go so much and you can come back and Moses said no we have to go and we are going for good we're going back to our land that God had given us so Ramsey said well if that's the case you can't go then another plague would come and then the last plague was um, the game changer, basically. The last play was the killing of the firstborn. God said, now, if you reject, if you keep resisting my will, then I will cause all the firstborns in your country to be killed, beginning from humans and even to the livestock. God said, I will send an angel around your land and, and kill all your firstborn because you refuse to let my people go. Now, that story is found in Exodus chapter 12. Just after Genesis is Exodus chapter 12. But let me read um, just a few verses from there. So God said, you did not listen to me, so I'll kill all your firstborn. But of course, the, uh, the problem was um, the Jewish people were living in the same land as well. So what about them? What about the Israelites? How can they be protected from this? So God said in verse 12, I will pass through the land of Egypt, and on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. So he's saying, I'm going to kill all firstborn, but 
This is how you can protect your household. Put blood on your house. And this blood shall be signed on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, he said, I will pass over you. In fact, God had actually um, just given some instruction before that in chapter 12 from verse 1 to verse 11. God said to the Israelites, now kill a lamb according to the number of people you have in your household. So if you have more people, you can kill multiple lambs. If it's small, then you can have one. If it's too small, you can kill one between the two households. However many you need, you kill the lamb and you know, roast the meat and, and eat the meat because the next day they're leaving on a long journey, so you need to be strengthened. So in a sense, God provides some food for that. But take the blood of the lamb and put that blood on the houses, on the door lintel and door posts. Make sure it is visible from outside because when I see the blood, I will pass over you and not bring the judgment on that house. But I will strike any house without blood. This is what we call the Passover lamb. Literally, that's what it means. Passing over. The judgment of God passes over that household with blood. And after that, they, they were given this law. Remember that you kill the Passover lamb? When you go into the land, land of Canaan, that God brings you into, you do this every year so that people are reminded of that. You kill the lamb every year so that your sin can be forgiven and death is paid, not with the death of yourselves, but death of the animal. And this is called the law of atonement. So God gave them this law to redeem them from their sin, and this is to pay the penalty for sin, as a symbol, by the way. In the Old Testament times, it was the lamb or the goat that was killed, and redemption was only by blood, meaning that you, know, you have to give life, kill actual life of the animal, and shed blood. And without shedding blood, there is no redemption. It says clearly, in Leviticus and Hebrews, without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Forgiveness is only possible with blood. And this is the law that was given to them. So this is how they carried out this. Basically, first of all, you have to know that you have sin, like we have studied. And they knew that because God gave them the law. And against the law, they all appeared to be sinful because God's law is perfect. And they would bring sacrifice animal. And this animal is transferred with all the sins of the people symbolically. So the priest would lay hands and sin is moved onto the animal. And the animal is now bearing the sin and therefore becomes the subject of judgment and killed instead of the people and dies bleeding. And the blood offering is given to God. And the priest would actually go into this uh, tent or the tabernacle and sprinkle the blood as a sign of that killing that took place for the sin of the people. So this is what happens on the atonement day. High priest brings the animal and people all come around the temple. And the sin of the people for that year symbolically is passed on to the animal. And the high priest takes the blood and blood is taken into the temple and sprinkled as a sign. This animal is killed as a ransom and that's the bloodshed. In Leviticus chapter 16, this is the actual prescription, or this is the instruction. He shall kill the goat of, his, of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, inside the veil meaning in the, in the temple, uh, in the tent, do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and that is to sprinkle, to sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Mercy seat is the top of the box inside the tabernacle that contains the, the tablets of the two tablets of the Ten Commandments and before the mercy seat on top and before the mercy seat because the mercy seat represents God's presence. It's called mercy seat because by God's mercy, sin is forgiven, but you need blood because God's law still cannot change. Just because God is merciful doesn't mean that he can change his rule. Because remember that God's law and God's rule is perfect and eternal. It cannot change, the truth cannot change. So he still allows with his law the atonement law, redemption law, substitutionary death. And the sign of that death is the sprinkling of the blood on the presence of God. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, therefore he says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, because it is the blood that makes atonement for your soul. It is the blood that brings forgiveness, because the sin, sin is paid for, is paid for. In the New Testament, it is reinforced by saying this, it says, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness without 
the blood. Let me show you a plan diagram of the temple, the tabernacle. This is basically what we call the tabernacle. This is the, the courtyard, and this is the actual tent. And inside the courtyard, there, they have an altar. Altar is where um, they burn the carcass of the animal, and labor is the water that priests use to wash themselves, to purify themselves. But they actually kill the animal on the altar. Now, this is the tem temple or the tent. This is the ark of the mercy seat, and there's a veil, a very thick curtain between the two rooms. The people come around the tabernacle on this particular day, and they bring the animal and kills the animal and burns the carcass and takes the blood of the animal. High priest takes the blood into the most holy place and sprinkles the blood on top of the ark. This is a little model of that, the priest doing the sprinkling of the blood. They also take another lamb, and this lamb or goat is taken into the wilderness, and it is left there to die, never to return. And that symbolizes that their sins are taken away, far away from them. And as they're doing that once every year, they are reminded that death has to happen for their sin, to be forgiven of their sin, to be accepted by God. This is the actual model of this tabernacle. You can see this little, um, you know, you've, you've got the altar, labor, and this tent. By the way, uh, the wall is about three meters high. So it, it's very high. You cannot actually look over. Um, and you know, it's all sort of surrounded by that. And um, this is where they carry out this ritual. They burn on the altar the carcass of the animal. And you can um, see that a whole lot of animals are brought. In fact, um, they were told to do this as a people nationally once a year. But even in between, they could bring their animals personally and ask the priest to do the sacrifice offering for them. So this was a place of basically the slaughtering animals. Um, you know, people could have, could have been bringing people, you know, animals uh, almost daily basis because you've got so many people, two million people and plus. And um, the priest's job was basically butchering these animals and sacrificing for them to God. So you see this, um, all this uh, little um, miniature model. Now this is the actual tent. You can see that there are two rooms, sanctuary and the most holy place. Sanctuary or the holy place and the most holy place, the holy of holies. Inside it looks like this. There's a little, um, little box. This is the high priest and this is a little box that contains the two stone tablets. This is the mercy seat. This is basically a statue of two angels, two angels looking down upon uh, the mercy seat and the priest is sprinkling the blood and when God accepts the sacrifice then the priest is um, spared of his life and he can come out if something goes wrong he is killed instantly inside the tabernacle so God told them do this every year every year and you see that again and again in the Bible for example here in Leviticus chapter 16 um, you confess the sins of the animals for all the children of Israel, their transgressions concerning all their sins, and putting them on the head of a goat, and shall send it away to the wilderness by the hand of a sort of man. So once killed and once taken into the wilderness, never to return to them. Basically, this is how God said, I will forgive your sins. But when you think about this, of course, you know, we've mentioned that briefly. It's not really possible that these animals can take away our sins actually. It's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came to the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Because animals cannot take away our sins actually, they were given only as symbols. We don't need to do that now because the actual sacrifice came actual sacrifice came. In all these sacrifice offering, it was only a reminder for their sins every year. They were reminded of that. But the actual sacrifice was to be that seed of the woman who was Jesus Christ. There's another verse in um, Isaiah that tells us this. We are like sheep that have gone astray. We have gone away from God, turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the inequitable soul. Just as the priest lays hands and transfers the sins of the people onto this animal, God lays 
like the high priest, our sins onto him. Now, who is this? That was the very question that we see in the book of Acts. Who is this? Of course, if you keep reading in the chapter, chapter 8, Philip says this is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who came to save us from our sins. So, when you look at verses like this, we understand why Jesus came. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He came into the world to save sinners. I'll show you a little diagram here. This is the world and this is me. You know, sinner, you don't need to think about other people. It, it concerns you. It is saying that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And that means to save me, death has to be paid. And that's why Jesus died on the cross. He rose again from the dead, obviously, because he's God. But he actually died on the cross, paying the penalty for my sins. And that is what we call substitutionary death. God allowed that under his law of redemption. And now, this is not animal, but this is a perfect sacrifice, human, but of course equally God at the same time. But at the same time, he is dying as someone without any sin. Because Jesus was the Son of God, he was completely free from sin. He was perfect. He knew no sin, but God made him sin for us. And therefore, his death had every power to pay the penalty for our sins. It, it is valid. It is acceptable to God. And he has ascended into heaven after the resurrection and he has done and finished the work. Do you know what Jesus said as he was dying on the cross? His very last words were, it is finished. It is accomplished. What is finished? Paying the price for our sin. And because he came, just like those animals, sacrificed animals, he is referred to as the Lamb of God. In John chapter 1, verse 29, we read, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, or look, watch, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He takes away the sin of the world. Literally, he takes away the sin of the world. World meaning not this earth, but people who have lived on this earth. He takes it away. On him. And that's why, going back to this verse here, notice that it says, The Lord God has laid on Jesus the iniquity of our soul. It is not our prayer or your asking, or it's not anything or anyone else, but it is, it is God himself who laid our sins on him. And because he's now carrying our sins, he becomes legally the subject of God's judgment. And therefore, he died on the cross. So he is now, propitiation simply means peace offering. He was given as a sacrifice offering for peace between us and God, for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So not just for those people who are writing and, and hearing this, but for the whole world, and that includes us. And if you believe this, well then that's the truth. If you believe and if you can actually accept and confess that this is true of me, then you enjoy the benefit of that full forgiveness and acceptance to God's kingdom. Now let me um, go back to Genesis and just um, tell you a little bit more about Genesis chapter 3 and, and finish there. Now in Genesis chapter 3, there is also another intriguing verse. Chapter 3, we saw that God gave them tunics of skin and clothed them. But after that, says this in verse 22, the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. And so he drove out the man and he placed cherubim or angels at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. It's really interesting imagery, isn't it? So he drove out the man and placed 
the angels to guide the way to the tree of life. And a flaming sword, or sword with flame or fire, a fiery sword. It's not that the angels are wielding the sword. No, the angels are there, but also the sword is there as well, which turns every way to guard the way of, or guard way to the tree of life. Now, what, what is this? Now, look at verse 22. Going up to chapter 3, verse 22, it says, They have become like one of us. One of us, like meaning they have now knowledge of good and evil like God. And he says, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Do you see that in your Bible, a line after that? It's not a hyphen. Hyphen is a little shorter. It's a line indicating that the sentence is not finished. It's like saying dot, dot, dot. The God is saying, lest he might do this. And of course... He simply does what is necessary after that in verse 23 and 24. Now think about this. Now Adam and Eve were innocent when they were created, but they're now, they now possess the knowledge of good and evil because they ate that fruit. They know what evil is. They know what sin is, what guilt is, what shame is. So they are uh, given the curse, as we saw in chapter 3. But now, if they stayed in the garden, they still have access to the tree of life. Remember that they most likely would have been eating that tree, eating that you know, fruit from that tree, so to enjoy eternal life. But they now lost that because they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But if they ate that fruit from the tree of eternal life, then they might live forever, here he says. You might think, well, living forever, is, is that a good thing? Well, living forever, if you simply look at the sort of the, the duration or you know, um, you know, whether it is um, in 100 years or forever, if you look at the duration, then that might sound okay. But also remember that yes, heaven is eternal place, but hell is also eternal place. People will live forever either in heaven or hell. It sounds like living forever with the knowledge of good and evil and in that kind of cursed state is like living in hell. So in fact, what we see here is God's mercy and kindness. He prevents them from eating the tree, eating the, fr fr the fruit from the tree of life because he doesn't want them to suffer that consequence of sin forever. He actually wants them to die. Now that might sound a little funny, but God wants Adam and Eve to die. Therefore, he cast them out of the garden of Eden and let them live and die in due time. Why? Because we know that God can bring the dead to life. We call that resurrection. Adam now has to die after living a life in this fallen world and face death to be raised from the dead to enjoy eternal life actually. Of course, when you're saved, you, you're promised eternal life. I mean, if you're, a, if, if you're a Christian, then you know that you have eternal life. But does that mean that you live forever in that state? I mean, if you can live forever with your, your fallen body, then that would be not so pleasant. It, it's almost like living like a zombie. You know, your, your body may still deteriorate from sin and the effects of sin. And if you can live and if you cannot die, then that would be an even greater curse. So if you want to live forever and have eternal life, you want, to do, you want to do that with not this body, but a new body. The Bible says that we will be given a new body and we will have the glorified body that is fitting for eternal life in terms, not only for the, the duration, but also the quality, the quality of life. We can enjoy the eternal life in heaven because we have a fitting and worthy body that can enjoy that eternal life. Now for Adam and Eve, they didn't have that. They lost that. They became mortal beings and they couldn't and they shouldn't live forever in the garden and they were banished out of the garden and that's also God's grace. You can see that. And he said, I will send them out of the garden and I'll make sure that they cannot come back. So the angels are guarding that gate to the garden of Eden and the flaming sword which turned every way. Now what, what's this then? Verse 24. 
angels. We understand angels. Angels are often associated with God's throne and God's presence. And they are guarding the way. So, you know, we understand that they, that they are like um, the, the guardians um, or they are like the soldiers um, guarding the way so no one can come. But what about this flaming sword? Now, flaming sword, um, it, it's a bit difficult to translate um, from the original text. Flaming sword can mean a sword that is literally on flame or fire, fiery sword. But it also can mean, um, you know, when you actually wield a sword, you see the, the sort of you know, light flashing, like reflecting and flashing. And, and it could be that kind of flame idea. You can even imagine, um, you know, flame, literal flame, not sword, more the flame and the fire that is actually circling around the way so that no one can come through that gate. But whatever it is, it is deadly. Sword means killing and death. You use sword to kill. And it is not just a sword, but it is a flaming sword. And God wants to make sure that no one can come. So in a sense, the tree of life is now hidden, protected, guarded, and no one can come, especially if you come with your sinful flesh. But God sent Jesus Christ, and he died in our place on the cross. Let me read from Isaiah and give you this little expression what Isaiah chapter 53 tells us. In Isaiah chapter 53, in verse 5, we read this. He, this is Jesus Christ, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Verse 6, we, re, we all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. If you keep reading, he says in verse 8, he was taken from the prison and from judgment. He was cut off from the land of the living. In verse 10, and yet it pleased the Lord God to bruise him. It was pleasing to God to destroy him, to kill him. Not because God was pleased to do that. It actually means he satisfied God, God's justice. We deserve the death punishment that Jesus took that on behalf of us. And it was pleasing in God's sight for him to be bruised, to be destroyed, to be killed. And that was only for Satan to bruise his heel. Satan might have thought he had victory when Jesus was dying on the cross, but that was to destroy Satan's work instead. And the total defeat would come, as we read in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. But going back to verse 5, he uses words like this. He was wounded, he was bruised, and he had stripes. Some translations use the word like he was pierced for our transgressions. He was pierced. Literally, when Jesus was on the, on the cross, you know that his hands were nailed. It's most likely that the nails, you know, big nails, as, as long as like, you know, 10 centimeters, 4 inch nail, uh, and it's thick. Um, it was driven most likely through the wrist because, you know, hands can tear easily supporting the body weight. If it's driven through the wrist, then you've got that mark. He also had this huge nail driven through his ankle, both feet together on the cross, and he was hanging there for at least six hours. Just to make sure that he was dead, a Roman soldier came and pierced his side with a spear. And blood and water poured out. And the medical experts say that that's normal. If you die, then blood and water get separated. And, and it's very likely that um, it splattered out of his wounds um, in clear fluid, water, and red blood. And Luke, who was a physician, observed that and wrote that in his gospel, in Luke's gospel. He was literally pierced on the side. Of course, all of that was for our sins, to die that most gruesome and excruciating, most sort of heinous death and execution at the time available. It's interesting that he was pierced on the side. It's almost as if that this tree of life is now barred from sinners. And sinners cannot go there and take that because to 
have that is to be punished into eternal hell and live forever in eternal hell. It's guarded, guarded carefully. But somehow Christ comes and Christ steps in. The flaming sword pierces through him, thereby stopping the, the flaming sword to open the way to the tree of life. And that is why Jesus said, I am the way, the only way, and the, and the life, and the truth. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Coming to the Father God is almost like coming to that tree of life, the source of God's word and wisdom, the truth. And in order to come to that truth and tree of life, you cannot just come, but because if you do, then you'll be killed by the flaming sword and the angels. But because Christ took our place and took that blow of the flaming sword, thereby opening the way to that tree of life so we can enter into the most holy place and come into the presence of God. That's how we can come to the tree of life and get that fruit of eternal life. Only through Him, only through Christ, there is a way to God. And that's why Jesus said, no one can come to the Father except, except through me. Jesus is the only way for salvation. Well, there's a lot more we can study and learn about Christ and what He's done. The time runs away from us. We need to stop here for today. But of course, th this is what we do. We, we learn from scriptures every time when we come together on Sundays. Um, sometimes on Fridays, Thursdays, Wednesdays, Tuesdays. And we have Bible studies and meetings every day when we can come and study the Word of God and learn about our Lord Jesus Christ. To believe in this truth and to accept this truth is to be saved. You know, we, we don't take this lightly. We take studying the Bible seriously. And we take living as Christians, Christian living seriously as well. And um, you know, we, we just try to preach the gospel. And we hold seminars like this about three times a year, but other times you also say you know, the same thing. We do the same thing. We study the Bible, we study the scripture, and come to the truth. It's our desire and prayer that more and more people will come to know this truth and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He is the only way. And we know that from Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there has been no other name given among men by which you must be saved. It is only through Jesus Christ can anyone be saved. Let's just make that clear and praise God for that. And just pray for our time today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we feel that time has um, escaped so, so quickly. But we thank you still during the short time that you have unfolded your truth to us and revealed some important, amazing truths through your scripture. This is like a hidden gem and treasure that is buried under the ground. And unless you do the hard work of digging and unearthing that treasure, you cannot appreciate the beauty of its truth. Well, we thank you that you have really helped us do that. And we thank you that you have once again spoken to us and let us know that Jesus is the only way. And yes, he is our redeemer. And many of us can say he is my redeemer. Lord, we thank you that you have come and taken our place. It is the demonstration of your love. You have demonstrated your love in this that even when you are still sinners, even when you are still your enemies, and without strength to come to you, you sent Christ, and Christ came and died in our place. It is a noble thing for a man to die for a friend, but you died for your enemy. As we were against you in our thought, in our deed, in our life. But you came and showed your love toward us. And you now call us to return to you very place where we belong. Lord, we thank you that we have responded to the calling. We thank you that you have accepted us as your children. And we pray that you'll call even more people to this 
amazing saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.